Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, a recap and reflection on Omar Khadr's keynote address at Dalhousie University. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hey, welcome to a on-location edition of The Andrew Lawton Show, the first of its kind, although hopefully we'll have more to come. I'm coming to you from Halifax, Nova Scotia, just after Omar Khadr took the stage as the keynote speaker at a Dalhousie University event put together by Dalhousie and the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative. Now, this event was in many respects one of the first times that Omar Khadr has ever uh, faced the audience in a way at a ticketed event like this in an open forum. It was supposed to be a venue for tough questions and it ended up being the event about nothing. Here's a guy, a convicted murderer, a convicted terrorist on stage and they don't address anything of substance. I'm going to talk about the event, and I'm also going to share clips from some of my interviews with people that were going into the event, people that were, in some cases, supportive of Omar Khadr, in some cases, people that had an open mind, and in other cases, people that were uh, thinking this was a profound mark of shame for Canada that this event was taking place. But I want to set the stage for it before I get too far into the weeds on it, because this event was presented as being about child soldiers. It was presented as being about holding Omar Khadr up as an example as a child soldier. And the reason for that is that if you accept that someone is a child soldier, you also have to accept that they are a victim and they are a passenger and not that they are a perpetrator or that they are a killer. And the reason that this was a relevant distinction is because it comes down to whether you are allowed to hold Omar Khadr responsible and hold him to account for what he's done by his own confession. And I'm never going to stop telling people and reminding people that he confessed to throwing the grenade that killed Sergeant Christopher Spear and injured Lane Morris, that left Tabitha Spear a widow, that left Taryn and Tanner Spear fatherless. And this is profoundly important because you talk about a Canadian ally, the United States having a soldier killed and the Canadian government exalting and lionizing by giving that ten and a half million dollar check that we all know about now. But again, I'll never stop reminding people of the gross disparity between the way that he should be treated by the government and the way he is treated by the government. And he was on stage at this event in Dalhousie with Ishmael Bea, who's a former child soldier himself from Sierra Leone. But the two are held up as being equivalents, which again pushes that narrative that Omar Khadr can't be criticized because he was just a child soldier. And even that term child, by the way, has implications and I'd say it has a lot of assumptions that people make when they hear child. And we heard it probably seven or eight times in the first 20 minutes of the event from the MC, from Romeo Dallaire, who spoke before things started, and also from the moderator, who was the executive director of the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative. So a couple of things, though. The CBC moderator, who was originally scheduled, uh, Nala Ayed, bowed out. And I emailed her and said, hey, you know, just curious about why you stepped down from this. No response from her. CBC did send out a statement that we received from a couple of places saying that they've decided to explore the topic in a different avenue down the road. And they may cover the event, but they're not going to be a part of it. And this in and of itself I find interesting because it also means that even CBC, and I guess I mean that even CBC, decided that, okay, maybe we don't want to be the cheerleaders of Omar Khadr at this event, which had they been on stage moderating as was initially planned would have been the outcome. And that I guess is the big sticking point here. This was not an opportunity to hold Cotter to account. This was not an opportunity to address any of the inconsistencies. This was an opportunity or could have been an opportunity to do these things, but it ended up being just a bunch of pablum. 
It ended up being just a bunch of pablum. Now, I was live tweeting throughout the event. The first question started out as being, how do you manage the cold of Halifax? Because admittedly, it was a pretty terrible weather day with freezing rain and all of that. And then the moderator realized halfway through the question that Omar Cotter lives in Edmonton, so he's managed the cold. So then the question just morphs into, how do you like life in Edmonton? Which is a real hard hitting question. Uh, other questions were, you know, how do you feel hearing about this story? How do you feel about this? And I was waiting, okay, maybe they're just easing into it. Maybe they're just gonna get there and their hard hitting questions are just around the corner and they never came. And even when they started taking questions from the audience that were submitted via this app called Slido, which I downloaded, I got the app and I even put my questions in and none of the questions, you could see what people were asking, none of the questions that really dealt with the substantive portions of Omar Khadr's life were asked. And by extension, none of them were answered. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on in this show about what those answers would be and what those questions should have been. And the reason for that is because we are looking at a guy who has had a red carpet treatment ever since he came back to Canada. And a guy who has never had to answer the tough questions. And I mentioned on a previous show that first press conference he had in the driveway of his lawyer, Dennis Edney's house, where Dennis Edney said, if anyone asks a question I don't like, we're taking him inside. And the media complied. And Omar Cotter, who sat down with the Toronto Star's Michelle Shepard. And again, no critical questions. Her main approach to it was that she had literally written a book calling him Guantanamo's child, a book supporting Omar Cotter. And time and time again, no difficult questions. And it's not about an, a railroading of him. It's not about ambushing him. It's about saying, listen, you say this, what about this? You say this, what about this? And that's especially germane now that he's decided to become a public speaker. He isn't just retreating into the wilderness and living his life and saying, you know, everyone leave me alone. I want a normal life, which is what he's previously said. He's taking the stage. He's taking the stage. So if you're going to answer questions, I think you have to answer genuine questions questions. And I will say that the moderator of the event said at the outset, the incident that happened in Afghanistan is off limits as far as questions are concerned, as well as any questions about his settlement with the government. Now she said this after saying, and I quote, we want you to ask hard questions, unquote. She said, you can ask about the difference between victims and perpetrators. You can ask about child soldier versus terrorist, all of these things. But you can't ask about the incident that happened in Afghanistan. Now, the incident in question is, of course, the firefight that killed Sergeant Christopher Spear and injured Lane Morris. That incident has had pretty long-term implications for a number of people in the United States and, by extension, in the West. And the incident that happened, you can't ask about. Okay, well, if you can't ask the guy that you're holding up as a child soldier about his most well-known battle, to use that narrative, why on earth are you saying that he's answering questions? He's not answering any questions. And she did address Christopher Spear, by the way. He was mentioned by name earlier on in her remarks, and she said that he was killed by a grenade allegedly thrown by Omar Khadr. Her word, allegedly. He's been convicted. It's a matter of fact. It's a matter of law. Reis judicata is the answer to this. It's already been adjudicated. He's done this. So to say, well, allegedly, and there was a, a snideness in that. And there was no live stream of this that the veterans outside could have seen, but I can only imagine their response to this. And I, I want to play one of the clips from uh, one of the veterans that I spoke with in particular. Uh, this is a gentleman by the name of Frank McLeod. And I'll let you hear for yourself what he thought about this. My name is Frank McLeod, and I'm just here to show my uh, disappointment with the Canadian people. What is the source of the disappointment? Uh, how, they, how Canada's react to uh, basically, uh, what do we want to call them, terrorists? And we're soft on it. What do we got, 60 ISIS fighters now in Canada, but yet our government doesn't look after our veterans? Come on. You know, we're not asking for much. We're just asking to be looked after and, and to be acknowledged for what we've done, because right now it's the opposite. And you're a veteran yourself? Yes, I am. Where did you serve? I 
served in Syria, I served in Bosnia, and I'm from Germany. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, if all of the things that you want as a veteran were looked after, would it bother you, those things that you just cited? Or is it is it the either or that you're finding yeah. troubling? No, it's not the either or. It's just uh, it's a lack of respect for our service members that have gone over. And we still have service members over there, you know, men and women that are put the uniform on and go. And then when they come home, they get looked down upon. You know, it's just, it's not the fact that uh, it's one or the other. It's just the fact that uh, he has, our government has multi-millions of dollars for terrorists and other companies and stuff, but yet veterans are asking for too much. Like, come on. Well, when you raise that issue, I have to ask, is the Omar Khadr frustration specific to Omar Khadr having this platform, or is it really symbolic of these other grievances that you're citing? No, it's, it's, about, uh, it's about what he did and how he did it. Um, child soldiers, we've all met them, we've all worked with them, we've seen them, what they do and all that. Uh, you don't stand there with a hand full of string and with hands on it that you cut off and be proud of the fact. You know, it's just not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You know? <laughs> And I think of all the people that served in the United States and imagine if the roles were reversed here and the U.S. were honoring someone who killed a Canadian soldier. Yeah. The outcry, and justifiably so, and oh, yeah. you know there has been some outcry from Americans over this, but even that has not really dampened any of the Canadian response to Omar Khadr from the media, from the government, all of these things. Well, uh, I find now that they treat him as a rock star. I know many men who are brave and women that are served and they come home and they're looked down upon. Like, why is a ter known terrorist looked upon as a rock star and a guy that serves or a woman looked down upon when they come home? You know, even our government does it to us all the time. Every time you ask, you know, try to get something, uh, DVA, it's deny, deny, then you die. Right? That's our motto with them, unfortunately. You know, it's just, uh, it's a slap in the face, it really is. When you look at uh, Canadians that, uh, like yourself, Canadians in uniform that have fought for freedom, do you think that includes the right for Omar Khadr to speak here? Yes, very much so. Uh, so this isn't about shutting him down. No, it's not no, about uninviting. It's about us telling, we do not feel that he has uh, to be brought up as a rock star sort of thing or out here to talk about child soldiers and all that. You can talk, go ahead, but we don't agree with what you're saying because we're from the other side of the fence. We're the guys that they were trying to kill with IEDs and stuff, you know? So it's just, uh, we just don't think it's correct. Now, like I said, I genuinely wanted to hear what people thought. Those who were supporting Cotter, those who were against Cotter, those who genuinely didn't know. And there were a few of those. What I found most baffling is how few people wanted to talk about what they were doing there. Now, maybe it was just the weather, like I said, freezing rain, it was a crappy day outside, but no one wanted to answer any questions. And by the way, I'm contrary to popular belief, I'm not a terrifying person. I'm actually very easygoing and convivial with these sorts of things because I genuinely enjoy having conversations. And I'd say to people, hey, uh, you know, do you want to talk about uh, what you're doing here? Hey, do you have any uh, thoughts about uh, why you're at this event? Hey, what do you think about child soldiers? And no one wanted to talk. And I don't know if it's because they don't know why they're there, because they're embarrassed that they're there, uh, because they just don't want to end up being a punchline if they say the wrong thing. I don't know. I don't know why, but people would not talk about what they were doing there, which was very disappointing because these are the people that were cheering him and ultimately giving Omar Khadr a standing ovation. This is that clip of the end of the event. Now, video, video recording was not allowed, and I obliged until the very end because the event was over at that point. And uh, this was the response. When they closed things up, Omar Khadr got a standing ovation. <laughs> This is not his first standing ovation, by the way. He also got one on To Le Monde en Parle, that uh, Radio Canada show on which he appeared. But this is a guy who, gets, I, I don't think I've ever had a standing ovation before, and he gets two of them after killing a soldier. Now talk about the real injustice in this all, I ingest, of course. But here's one of the people that I did speak with that was able to say what they thought about Omar Khadr being there. This guy seemed like an academic, the way he talked about imperialism and the empire and all of that. But we had a, a reasonable enough conversation. I'm not there to railroad people. I'm there to highlight what they think. Here's that clip. Well, I'm just really glad to see that uh, Omar Khadr is kind of having a platform to talk a little bit about his experience as a child soldier. And yeah, 
kind of hear what he's got to say? Now you say child soldier. A lot of people say terrorist. How do you square those two? Well, I mean, the people who say that he's a terrorist are just wrong. I mean, he's factually a child soldier. Uh, but he was in Al-Qaeda on the battlefield, killed an American soldier. How is that not uh, terrorism? If, well, it's not terrorism because he was in Afghanistan and America was an invading army at the time against a country that hadn't declared war against America. So America is an invading army in that context. Now, there are a number of veterans out here that say Omar Khadr having a platform dishonors their sacrifice. What's your message to them? Oh, it doesn't. I think that there's a structure at play here that's bigger than what an individual did. And to think that a child, a 15-year-old, could somehow come to signify the entirety of the history of imperialism that uh, soldiers themselves have been sort of treated as pawns in, I think it makes light of the entirety of the situation. So do you say, think, see them as equivalent then, the Canadian and American soldiers and Omar Khadr in that case? It's not that I see them as equivalent. I think they're quite different. One of the biggest differences is that a soldier is a grown adult who makes a conscious, informed decision to do what he or she is choosing to do. They, they decide to go to war. A child soldier, by definition, does not decide to go to war. You know, they're organized into it. So he's, he's a victim in that context then? He's a victim, yeah. Uh, do you think that it is that black and white, though? Or do you think there no, is a middle ground between it's, terrorist and victim? It's precisely that it isn't black and white is the point that I'm trying to make. That you can't just look at a child and, and define that child as a terrorist or not a terrorist. They're a human being that is a product of generations of uh, empire. So even for people that are going there to support Omar Khadr, I don't think they got anything of substance out of this except for being able to say, I saw Omar Khadr on stage. And that's my big frustration with this event is that there was nothing. I mean, even for me going in as somewhat of a skeptic, there's very little to take away because he didn't say anything. And I don't even put the blame squarely on Omar Khadr for that, by the way. He was not put in a situation where he had to answer any questions. You know, I, I want to read some of the questions that were put to Omar Khadr in the app that were never actually asked. And th there were some questions that were very reasonable questions in here that I would have loved to have heard answers to. Some of them were just hilarious. Uh, this is uh, one who says, as a fellow Canadian citizen, I want to apologize for how the Canadian government treated you and abandoning you for those 10 years. So uh, some people are, are just there to get their fan mail in. But someone says, is there a specific age or mentality that makes someone a child soldier? Uh, someone else asks, Many Canadians feel enormous sympathy for you, but less so for your parents. Can you please speak about your own feelings about your parents? I think that's a, a very good question. My question that I put in the app, what's your message to the families of soldiers killed by IEDs in Afghanistan? Another question that was put forward in the app that I thought was a very positive one or could have been a very positive one, do you have resentment towards the people who put you to war or have you found forgiveness for them? Now, I don't know if it's a question of forgiveness, but does he resent his family? And this is where you get into what I think is the most critical contradiction in the Omar Khadr as a victim narrative, which is his relationship with his family. If you accept he's a victim, you have to be a victim of something or a victim of someone. It's not just about being a victim of circumstance. Omar Khadr, if you view him as a victim, was a victim of his family. His father was an Al-Qaeda financier, his mother's a radical, his older sister's a radical. So he was a victim of them if he was a victim of anyone. Yet that same family, he fought tooth and nail to have more access to. His father is dead, but he wanted unsupervised access to his sister. He wanted to be able to visit her. He wanted to be able to go to Saudi Arabia. He wanted to have closer connections with his family. If your family is the reason that you were put through what you describe as the worst experience of your life, why would you actively and fervently fight to be closer to that family? And I get that family dynamics are complicated, but you cannot say that you've moved beyond radicalism if you are not prepared to answer the questions about your relationship with your family, your view of your family, and if you are not prepared to denounce your family's ties to radicalism, which are undisputed. 
they're undisputed. His father was in bin Laden's inner circle. He was a financier. His sister has said that Omar Khadr is uh, great because he killed the soldier, and most parents should be fortunate to have a child that's going to do that. She said that in an interview, by the way. She's also said bin Laden is a great guy, and that Al-Qaeda has a mission. So these are the people that were surrounding him when he ended up getting embroiled in the world of terror, yet they're also the people that he is still surrounding himself with now. And that was not a question worth asking when Omar Khadr took the stage at Dalhousie University. That was not a question worth asking. I don't know how. I don't know how that's not. How is that not the first question? And you know, Omar Khadr comes off as a very charming guy. He comes across as very meek in many respects. In fact, Ezra Levant ended up just by fluke being on the same airplane as Khadr from Toronto to Edmonton and didn't notice it until the end. So Ezra went and tried to talk to him at the airport and his first response is, do you want a selfie? And wouldn't take questions. He just kept smiling, stone-faced, didn't say anything, didn't respond, didn't engage. And... This is a guy who, again, on stage, comes across as just very mild and unassuming. And he said something. He said something that I, I really found positive at the end. He said, you know, I'll talk to anyone. I'll have a conversation with anyone. He said, even people that are critical of me, uh, they are doing it from a place of pain, and we can find some understanding. I'll talk to anyone. Well, talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to someone that's going to ask difficult questions. Because I, I'm actually a firm believer in second chances. I am. I'm a firm believer in people being able to move beyond bad things in their life, but you have to actually move beyond them. And I am totally willing on anywhere he wants, anywhere he wants to sit down and have a conversation with Omar Khadr. That's my offer. And ask the questions that I think are essential, like the relationship with the family, like his true belief about what happened, like his belief on some of the geopolitical situations that emerge that involve Al-Qaeda, that involve radical Islam, that involve Islamic terror and jihad. And these are the questions that need to be answered if people are going to view him in the way that he wants to be viewed. I want to play a clip from my chat with Ezra Levant right after the event. Now, Ezra as I, I showed a brief little uh, B-roll uh, package of earlier, uh, saw Omar Khadr at the airport, tried to get an interview, didn't end up getting any answers out of him. Uh, but I did speak with Ezra after the speech at Dalhousie to get his thoughts. So Ezra, what was it that really brought you here? Because I know you've covered this case for years. Well, I wanted to hear what he had to say when he was given direct access to students, including high school students. I wanted to hear if he was going to start recruit or propagandize because he's never renounced the jihad. He's never renounced his father's terrorism. He's never renounced his own act of murder. So um, I think he played the room like a violin. And uh, I mean, they were ooing and cooing over him. Um, of course, no real questions were put to him about his murder. Um, I mean, he's an Al-Qaeda terrorist. The most shocking part of the day for me, of course, was coming here when I actually saw him on an Air Canada plane. I was shocked that he wasn't on the no-fly list. Uh, the Air Canada pilot and flight attendant I spoke to were shocked too. So, I mean, listen, I think Canadians are hospitable and we're friendly, but in this case, we're being taken for suckers. This guy has never renounced the family business or his family for that matter. He's a terrorist. So what's the question or questions that weren't asked that you thought needed to be asked for this to be of substance? Well, I had a few technical questions, uh, you know, about why he's hiding the money from the widow and the two or uh, kids whose father he killed. I mean, if he really is sorry, why is he going to such lengths to hide money from them? I mean, is he sorry or not? And is he sorry? Or is he not sorry and denies he ever did it and is fighting his own confession? Technical questions uh, about his conduct in Guantanamo Bay. For example, he told guards there that killing Christopher Spear was the best day of his life. He told a black female guard at Guantanamo Bay that she was 
a bitch and a slave because he hates women, obviously, and he hates blacks, obviously. So these things were not done by a 15-year-old. They were done by a 20-year-old, 21, 22, 23. He, in fact, led the uh, prayers in Guantanamo Bay. He was so fundamentalist there, and he fomented against the guards in Guantanamo Bay. He revved up the other prisoners against uh, the order in Guantanamo Bay. So this this pretend act of contrition and meekness is just fleecing all these suckers here who love it. So I guess then the big question is, is there anything that he could do to turn the page on this? Because he's saying on that stage, that's all he wants. He wants to just not have to feel bad when he's out in the world. Well, uh, Dr. Michael Wellner and others who have studied radical uh, Islamic terrorism, see there's three indicia for whether or not someone is really reformed or not. One of them is religiosity. Are they still really hardcore fundamentalist Muslims? And of course with Omar Khadr the answer is yes. Uh, the second is, is he still associating with uh, the people who he was running with when he committed this terrorism? Again, the answer is yes. Not only in person, but online, his sister, who says that Al-Qaeda is no big deal. And the final thing is, has he actually renounced publicly the jihad? And again, no, he has not. So the three indicia, he's three for three. You know, if I try to drill down into what to take away from what Omar Khadr said, there are a few things. Number one, he's surrounded by enablers. He's surrounded by people that genuinely view him as a rock star and as a celebrity. And that's not entirely his fault, by the way, but he's surrounded by people that just want to fawn over him and protect him and build this bubble, this envelope around him and not let him answer any tough questions because these people genuinely don't think that he has anything to answer for. These people do not believe that he has anything to answer for. So those people around him will always put the questions to him that are like, tell me a nice moment from your childhood. And then Omar Cotter talked about how his dad bought him a horse or how's the cold treating you or how do you like Edmonton or whatever the case may be. You know, there was at one point he was talking about why he is viewed differently than Ishmael Bea is, for example, and the vision of a child soldier being a small African child with a gun. And that was, the again, the whole context of the event. They're trying to say that Omar Khadr needs to be viewed in the same terms that we would view these people. And Omar Khadr actually said something very interesting, and I actually don't disagree with it. He said, it's hard to forgive someone when they do something that impacts you. And he said, that's the feeling that Canadians have because an American soldier was killed. He said, you know, Canada, America, it's all the same. And then the moderator interjected to say Canada and the United States are not the same, especially now. So there was a veiled uh, Trump reference, of course, and then the audience loves it and hoots and hollers. And Omar Khadr then, who's just said something I agree with, responds by saying, quote, I don't believe in borders and I don't believe in nationalities, unquote. So I'd say that was the only time during the evening that we got something from him that tells us a bit about who he is and what he believes and what he feels. I don't believe in borders and I don't believe in nationalities. And I wonder who teaches him this? Who teaches him this? There was another point in the evening when someone asked him where he, why he's speaking up now. And he said, well, I, I want to do some work. I'm trying to figure out my calling in life and I wanted a safe space to do it. Now, here's a guy who in some situations is saying, listen, I'm still figuring out how to navigate the world, how to interact with people, how to trust. And then on the other hand, he's using Berkeley rhetoric. He's talking about safe spaces, open borders, uh, post-nationalism. And all of these things are like, you know, I get that he likes to read, he says, but this is what happens when you're surrounded by people that are infecting you with an agenda. These are not things that you just come up with. These are things that you're taught. These are things that you're told or things that you come to learn and come to believe based on what you're told. And when he's talking about these sorts of things, he is becoming an activist and he's surrounded by activists. And that's going to be very interesting to see if he does speak out more 
how that unfolds. And on that note, uh, there was some discussion about whether this was going to be a national speaking tour of some kind. And I never, I never saw that, but people were telling me they were seeing it elsewhere. I never saw it. Uh, my interest was in whether he was getting paid, whether Omar Khadr was getting a speaking fee of any kind. And I had asked the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative and didn't get a response. I asked uh, Dalhousie University, didn't get a response. Eventually, I just ran a story about the fact that they weren't responding, and that story ended up getting shared quite a bit. And they addressed that on stage, believe it or not. They said he's not getting a speaking fee, and it's not a publicity stunt, and it's not the beginning of a larger tour. So Romeo Dallaire, Child Soldiers Initiative, and Dalhousie are saying this is just a one-off. And does it matter? If he were getting a speaking fee, would it make a difference? I don't think it would necessarily from the context of what he's doing. I think it would matter in the sense of a publicly funded university, Dalhousie, handing over a check to a convicted terrorist. I think that's the issue. That's the question mark. And as you saw from my interview with Frank McLeod, the veteran earlier, the issue is not about free speech. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve the right to speak. No one is saying that. Even the veterans outside, they're the first to line up and say, we defend Canadian rights. We protect Canadian rights. The issue is always and has always been about judgment. The judgment in holding this guy up as a victim, holding him up as a hero. You know, he was not just viewed by the audience as being a guy who was in the wrong place at the wrong time, a guy who was a victim of circumstance, a victim of his family. He was held up as a hero. Romeo Dallaire, a man who has done more for peace and more for Canada than most people I've ever met, and I have interviewed uh, Lieutenant General Dallaire. Despite my disagreements with him on political issues, the guy certainly has earned the right to say what he wants and to advocate it. I know he's seen horrific, horrific things. Dallaire, at the very beginning of the event, said that Cotter is a magnificent gentleman. A magnificent gentleman. Now, you can say many things, and even if you don't necessarily like the idea of calling him a terrorist, is there not a bit of a, lo- a, bit of a gap between terrorist and magnificent gentleman that you could probably find something more accurate in the middle of? Magnificent gentleman. And that term stuck with me. Why is he a magnificent gentleman? Why? If he is a victim, if he is a passenger, and if he's just some guy, some poor kid that didn't know what was going on, and now he's out on his own uh, free after serving his sentence, what, what is magnificent about that? What is gentlemanly about that? So if he has done nothing and he's just been along for the ride, why does he get any credit for that? Why are people so fond of him? Again, that standing ovation. Women in the audience when he was talking going, aww. I, and I, I was waiting to do the show to share that, by the way, because I didn't know how to like tweet about that. I didn't know if it was a sigh. I didn't know if it was uh, an exhale. I didn't know if it was a whinny. Uh, so not a whinny. That's what uh, horses do whinnies. Okay. Anyway, I take that part back. But he, <laughs> like, like he would say something like, oh, you know, I find it hard to be myself. And they would just go, aww. So they're actually fans. They're actually fans of him. And this is a guy that has the power to do a lot. If he does a national speaking tour, he'll sell out. I mean, the the event wasn't packed. Part of that might have been the weather. Certainly there was a lot of interest in it. But the people tend to love him. And they can't answer why. They can't answer why, because if he is a victim, if he is a passenger, he's not deserving of love and fandom. And if he's a terrorist, he's certainly not. And even if you view somewhere in between, there were some people there that I think were genuinely there with open minds about, ah, you know, I want to hear. But even those people were supporters. Those people were supporters. They wouldn't uh, view him as a terrorist. There was this one woman I spoke with, for example, very kind. We had a lovely interaction, but she, despite saying she's open, she wants to listen, there's probably a real story there, couldn't call him a terrorist. So so what brings you out to this event? I, I'm really interested in hearing what, uh, what he has to say and um, 
You know, I was thinking there are four or five stories to everything, mm. right? And somewhere in between, in the middle, is the truth. So you're not here uh, viewing him as a terrorist or viewing him in a supportive way. You're looking for that in between. I'm just interested in in what he did, and our government gave 10 point million, 10.3 million dollars to him. Um, I, I just know I don't consider him a terrorist. I can. I'm just I'm open. I I just really want to hear him. What would you like to hear him say? Oh my gosh, um, the truth. And he, maybe he's already said the truth, but yeah, just where he's coming from, um, just the truth. And I think that was true of a lot of the people. There were I won't play every single interaction I did because a lot of them were very similar to one another. I've tried to show you a cross section of the people I spoke with, the veterans, the people with open minds, the supporters, and all of that. But that is genuinely what you're dealing with here. And I think if it's important to you that Omar Khadr is speaking, you have to either decide what you think he did or what you think it represents or what you want to hear from him now or what you think he needs to do, all of these things. And I'm not sure that introspection was being done. I think people have just decided they support him and he's on stage and it's like if Michael Bublé comes to town. You may not like his new album, but you like Michael Bublé and he can sing whatever he wants and you'll go there. And I think that was the same thing here. I think Omar Khadr, uh, they don't even know what the latest album is, but they've decided they like him, so they're going to get a ticket to the show. And that was what happened. Now, I, I do have to say, I support free speech. And I'm glad that the event was not disrupted for whatever grievances I have with Omar Khadr, that the way you settle those is not by taking away someone's right to free speech, in my view. And I also have to say that the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative does a lot of really important work. They do. My issue is with viewing Omar Khadr as a child soldier. And uh, the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative, they were very good with me. They knew who I was. They knew where I was from. Uh, when I showed up in the cold, uh, soaking wet, they said, oh, here's your media badge. Come on in. We'll bring you to the media seat. So they were not uh, at all trying to stop me from doing my job. Now, in true Ezra Levant fashion, they did try to stop Ezra from going in, but eventually he won, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which uh, I don't think he was expecting, but he did get in. And I'm glad he was able to, uh, to chat with us after about that. So I want to share just a few final thoughts on this before I, I close out today's show. Because it would be great if I could show you the video of the event and, and say, you know, here's when he said this, here's when he said this. I can't do that. No videography was allowed. The only clip that I got was that uh, little bit about uh, the standing ovation, which I think says more than a lot of the clips of the event itself could, frankly. It's not about hatred of Omar Khadr as a person. If he were just to say, I want to live my life as he has said, and he were to do that, I don't think it's fair to track him down, bang on his door and say, you need to answer for this. In the eyes of the law, he's walking free. I do think it is incredibly fair when he injects himself into public discourse, when he injects himself into a public discussion to ask questions. And I, I think it's profoundly dangerous for an organization, for people to say, we're going to ask the hard questions and then not permit any of those questions, to not ask any of these questions. You can ask tough questions, you can ask challenging questions in a way that is diplomatic, in a way that is sensitive, in a way that doesn't threaten a safe space, but they didn't do that. I, I'd say the hardest question you know, I don't even know the hardest question, actually. I'd say the hardest questions were the ones that weren't asked, the ones that were never posed. That one question uh, that was up on the, the, the one that I loved, I'd say is the easiest question. Where do you find the patience and generosity to face the hypocrisy of your critics? I hope you have found peace, brother. And that was a, a question that had more thumbs up in the question app than than most other questions did. So certainly that was the audience there. That was the audience. They were there because they supported him, they liked him, they wanted to hear from him. And at the end of it, if you're a Canadian veteran, you are quite literally out in the cold. I want to thank everyone who supported this. 
who supported this uh, fully crowdfunded effort to send my videographer and I to Halifax. We had a, a great time talking to people and uh, more importantly, covering a story that the mainstream media really didn't and, and didn't cover in a way that had any skepticism. So all of you who chipped into that, we really appreciate it. And to the people that uh, agreed to chat with me and the one woman who gave me the finger and the other three that called me racist, thanks to you as well, uh, because there's nothing better than being in the freezing cold and being called a racist. So thanks very much for that. We'll talk to you later this week with more of The Andrew Lawton Show. Thank you, God bless, and from Halifax, good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.